вершине И зовет олимпийский огонь золотой Будет земля счастливой и молодой Нужно сделать все Что поверь олимпийский огонь не показ Christ. Welcome back to Konstantinovsk and the year 1980. And as you can see, we now have some public transport in our city. As you can see from these pictures, we're using very similar trams to the ones that were used in Kaliningrad in 1980. We're using Tatra T3 trams, which are a more common variant on the Tatra T4s that Kaliningrad used. But before we get bogged down in details and get on with the episode proper, I wanted to give you a quick recap of the areas that we've covered so far, as well as show you a couple of little updates I've made to the central square and the buildings that surround it, such as this in-tourist sign that I've placed on the hotel. Uh, in-tourist was the primary travel agent of the Soviet Union for foreign visitors, and though Kaliningrad wasn't open to tourists, Konstantinovsk certainly is. And while we're at ground level, I want to talk a little bit about the vehicles we've got going around the city. You'll see some old Trabants and FSO Polonaise, as well as the standard Ladas and Volgas. And those would have been obviously imported from East Germany and Poland. Uh, but I've been very careful not to use any vehicles that weren't readily available to the public before the year 1980. As you can see, we've got these standard orange USSR edition Icarus 260 buses that would have been imported from Hungary as well. A lot of the assets that I've used to update this central square area have been made by the wonderful Chris Brammer, who created this hammer and sickle monument you see ahead of you here. Here I'm just creating a custom park bench uh, that looks like a quarter of a cog wheel from above, and I'm using a retaining wall and some concrete blocks as procedural objects to do that. And while we're over this way, we might as well take another look at my favourite creation from the last episode, which is Raduga, which I imagine to be some sort of fashion boutique. But anyway, this little recap is coming to a close, and we're almost ready to start the episode proper. Let's start with some 50s era apartments with entrances at the rear. These would have been among the first buildings to go up during the rebuilding after the Second World War. Of course, the main reason that we want the apartments to have their main entrances at the rear is that the front of these buildings at the ground level will be reserved for commercial, so greengrocers, furniture shops and such. We'll get into more detail with that a little bit later on. I've been making here is a custom commercial building attached to the hotel that I'm going to assume is a sort of hotel bar or restaurant, a gastronom for the Gostinitsa. Just quickly showcasing a couple more of Chris Brammer's buildings right there, an office building and restaurant at the base there. And I wanted to say I really, really, really appreciate um, the shout out that he gave to me in his last video. Um, all of a sudden, I had people watching my videos, which was amazing. <laughs> um, all this to say, what an asset creator, what a builder, and I look forward to working with him in the future. Let's just leave it at that for now. <laughs> Here's one of my favourite little details in this build so far, and of course, it's rubbish related. So where the bins get collected is nice and secluded, and I imagine it would be the place where the chefs and restaurant staff would go for their cigarette breaks as well. <music> the 
these cobblestone tramway foundations by Puex on the workshop have proven to be pretty invaluable to me, uh, especially in creating the impression that the tramway existed before the road. Now you see this style of building repeat itself quite a lot on Lenin Avenue in Kaliningrad, and it will do here as well. But to break up the monotony, uh, we've got these little archways that I'm going to try and recreate here using this Skyway asset. And I'm going to double that up at a certain point in the future of this video so that they become two-story walkways as they are in Kaliningrad. But first of all, we need to create some steps that go up to the shops on the front of these uh, apartment buildings. And I'm using the steps from the Tiergarten Memorial in Berlin and turning them into procedural objects and get rid of the excess at the back. And the reason I'm doing that rather than using network stairs or other stair props is I'm trying to save on prop count and network count so this series doesn't come to a premature end. And uh, using procedural objects pushes that time further and further away. We've got the flags out on the lampposts here, and that's because it's May 1980, as I've mentioned previously. So between the May Day Parade and the Victory Day Parade, and of course there would be quite a lot of uh, bunting up around that sort of time of year. using a different style of building on this side of the street because I'm thinking here these would have been uh, partially um, intact buildings from uh, old Königsberg and they would have been rehabilitated by the Soviets um, after they took over administration of the city um, because a lot of the time when you're rebuilding a city after a war you do have to make do and mend um, rather than building right from scratch so where there is something left you've got to make use of it. Of course, no Soviet build will be complete without this cinema by Alex B.Y., which has been on the workshop since, well, since the game came out. And I put two little movie posters up there that I created, and they are for Moscow Doesn't Believe in Tears, which is a melodrama that came out in early 1980, and Air Crew, which was a two-part disaster movie that came out in uh, late 79, early 1980 also. Bit of an odd double feature, but there you go. using the first-person camera mod to uh, take a walk down Lenin Avenue so far and see how it's looking from first-person view. And I think it's handy to take uh, close-up views of your city every now and then like this. Uh, it can inform you as to what you're missing and what you could be adding. Putting down some more surviving Königsberg era buildings at the end of the avenue here. And I'm using a mixture of German and Polish buildings. And of course, uh, that's because Königsberg, Kaliningrad, and therefore Konstantinovsk will sit on the uh, border of Poland. And I wanted to reflect that sort of cultural proximity in the architectural styles here. I wanted this row of Königsberg buildings to end quite abruptly, just to imply that there'd been some post-war demolition um, of some of the more structurally unsound buildings left over from the conflict. Uh, but that leaves us with a blank wall, and of course wherever there's a blank wall, there's room for a mosaic. As you can see, I'm using quite a lot of decals in this area on the pavement, and that would normally be quite a prop-heavy, frame-rate-destroying uh, thing to do, but as you can see, I've turned them all into procedural objects, the same as these fences here. And 
that will stave off for some time the uh, hitting of any kind of prop limit. Uh, but at some point I'm going to have to make sacrifices on the level of detail. I think some areas will have to get less attention than others. But let's not worry about that now. We're going for a walk in the park. The Motherland Calls is an iconic monument to the heroes of Stalingrad, and it stands over that city which is now known as Volgograd. But it has this companion statue, and I'm going to be placing it in this location in Konstantinovsk, uh, where there is a different statue called Matrusha. Of course, I didn't want to place the Motherland Calls statue itself in Konstantinovsk. It's a bit too iconic and tied up with uh, Stalingrad and Volgograd. But this companion statue, like I said, of the uh, soldier carved into rock, uh, serves its purpose well here as a uh, soldier on the mountain, as I've uh, named it here. And the mountain in question being the Berg in Königsberg. Here's a little detail I was pretty chuffed with. Um, I've sunk these fence pieces into the ground um, a little bit further and turned them into procedural objects. And that creates these little ankle high uh, barriers that act as a sort of keep off the grass mechanism. So that was the soldier on the mountain. I thought it'd be nice to just focus on one small area for a little while and break up the video a bit. We've got another one of these little focus builds a little bit later on in the video. But for now... Now I'd actually already made a start on the areas behind the avenue uh, specifically this little area which is behind the hotel and I'd finished it during the last episode but didn't really show any of it in the cinematics uh, because I was more focused on the uh, other side of the central square so I thought I would give it a bit more of an airing this time out. We'll come back to this park in a little while but for now we're working on this underpass building. Now I'm not quite happy with this particular asset for it, it's a little bit too ornate I think for my liking. Uh, so I do replace that with a more um, modernist looking building. But as with everything in this city, it's a bit of a patchwork with cobblestone and more sort of modern additions. And we're going to have a quick look at that underpass building now, I think. Wait, first of all, there's these three buildings here. Uh, well, it's actually one building, but you'll see what I mean here. With the sloped roofs, but the Soviet-style window bays. I'm going to do something about that with uh, procedural objects in a little while, I think. But this is the underpass building here that I was talking about. And there's an asset that's been made by the uh, asset creator. I think they go by Litchby Arts on the workshop. Anyway, this is the uh, set of buildings that they've uh, created. Uh, well, one of them anyway. It's a Polish modernist building from the 1930s and it just goes perfectly as a replacement for that underpass building here. So here's where I go uh, a bit mad with procedural objects and use uh, the, one of these German buildings for its roof, uh, the slanted roof. It's very much in the same style as the ones we saw in Kaliningrad in that shot from Google Images. And then I use a Soviet building as the base and muck around with that in PO as well. Um, quite happy with this actually. And there's quite a lot of buildings around Kaliningrad that have this sort of style roof, but then obviously the Soviet lower half. So it's nice to know that this can be done. Anyway. 
placing down this H-shaped school here, uh, and you see this shape a lot well, on um, aerial views of Kaliningrad. Uh, they're all over the place. And even though these aren't micro districts per se, they still follow the, the city planning principle of micro districts that education and all other basic communities should only be within walking distance of any significant residential population. Starting to colour outside the lines a little bit here by putting down these Brezhnevka buildings. They're a bit far away from the avenue for me to be detailing them today. Now, one thing you see a lot of in Kaliningrad are rows of garages. And did that graffiti just say too drunk to. Anyway, you see lots of rows of garages in Kaliningrad. Less so in Soviet times, but still enough that Eldar Ryazanov, the film director, made a film called The Garage, about a garage collective, which is something like a freehold committee that you'd have in a block of flats or um, any other kind of community organisation like that, um, except with a little bit more, uh, I guess, control over the way that uh, funds are used and allocated. Further up the lane here, there's this library and this sort of fancy looking old manor sort of building. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a mishmash of a few different buildings here. I'm mainly aiming to get the textures right so that it looks okay from street level. It might look a little bit odd with these three buildings sort of mashed together, but once you're walking past on street level, which is the sort of level of detail that I'm going for, the wall textures at least look the part. And I wanted the Konstantinovsk version of this library to be a little bit larger than the one in Kaliningrad, so I've put three of these uh, library buildings together and used the outer two as sort of extra wings of the building and worked some procedural object magic to make sure that the textures didn't all start clashing. These tram roads are all well and good, but the catenaries in the middle are bothering me a little bit because they're not very much like the uh, way that the tram roads are organized in Kaliningrad, where the, uh, the cables are sort of attached to the lampposts rather than having sort of individual catenaries in the middle of the road. So I'm going to do a bit of a fix on that a little bit later on in this episode. Just next to this small clinic here, I've placed down a banya, so like a, a public bath. And public baths were obviously a popular feature in all cultures worldwide throughout history, but it's especially carried on as a sort of traditional meeting place in many parts of uh, Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and in Russia. And during the Soviet times, they were uh, especially popular sort of meeting places as depicted here in the film The Irony of Fate or Have a Nice Bath uh, by Elder Ryazanov and uh, the central events of the uh, film are triggered by the uh, main character Genya and uh, his friends getting blackout drunk in the banya because it wasn't just a, a place to get clean in a ritualized sort of way but it also doubled as a kind of social club where you could order drinks and just chill out with your friends. And I guess I bring up all these uh, Soviet-era films not 
just because they're good films and worth seeing, but also because they um, they sort of inform you uh, when you're building the city with a certain level of realism of uh, what people in your city might be getting up to and what buildings you place down, uh, what impact they'll have on uh, the sort of uh, virtual community that you have. And I'm not saying for one minute that every City Skylines player needs to uh, go out and completely immerse themselves in whatever culture they're trying to, um, I guess, uh, recreate in their cities. Uh, What I am saying is that it helps me when I'm trying to think about what should go where. If you're placing down a cinema, it might help to think, well, what's on there? And if you're placing down a banya, then it helps to know what is going on there as well. I guess the um, the principle I'm getting at is that a city is meant to serve the people that live within it, and looking pretty is uh, uh, comes second to that. Um, but if you have a city that serves, that is designed to serve its people correctly, uh, if you're building with that sort of principle in mind, then your city will have a realism that is uh, probably more beautiful than uh, if you were just going for a purely um, aesthetic um, sort of building goal. Anyway, I've rambled on for a while. Um, we're looking at Google Maps here because I just wanted to show you the uh, sort of colourful buildings that you see on some of the side streets in Kaliningrad here. And that's what I've been trying to recreate. So if you thought that green building looked a little bit too garish, then that's why it's there. But there's also some um, old Kenigsburg buildings there. And I want to uh, get back to that sort of patchwork of architecture that we talk about so much in this series. As promised, we're doing another little uh, focused build here, and we're doing a university, or at least a part of a uh, sort of network of campuses around the city of Konstantinovsk that will make make up the uh, VUZ, the Higher Educational Institute of Konstantinovsk. And the um, field of study that this university is going to focus on uh, will be physics and aeronautical technology specifically. Uh, Kaliningrad actually produced uh, quite a few uh, cosmonauts um, for the Soviet Union. Um, many people who didn't come from Kaliningrad actually went to study uh, in in the city. So I wanted uh, to at least have that uh, thread of continuity between Kaliningrad and Konstantinovsk. But um, we'll talk a little bit about the um, cosmonaut program in another episode when we can focus a little bit more on that area. watched my previous two videos then you'll know that this music means we're coming towards the end of the episode. I'm doing a few little details to finish up here. So what I've got here is a bunch of clutter that's uh, sort of sitting outside one of these apartment buildings and I wanted to give the impression that someone was either moving in or moving out of uh, one of the houses there. 
And now I'm just doing a little outdoor area for one of the cafes on the main drag here, uh, using obviously uh, props and turning them into procedural objects. And then I use these uh, seat site uh, park building things. There's this tiny little red dot that you put onto uh, any props that you want Sims to sit on, and they will sit on it. Uh, next, I'm uh, adding some flags to uh, the balconies of these apartments. Again, it's uh, between May Day and Victory Day, so we've still got the bunting out. One more reference, and this time it's to a book uh, called The Twelve Chairs by uh, the writing duo Ilf and Petrov, uh, written in 1928. Um, the store uh, front that I was uh, putting those twelve chairs in front of was also called The Twelve Chairs, and so yeah, referenced that as a furniture store. And after adding some very necessary uh, rubbish tips there, uh, we're finally going to sort out this tram road, as I said. So I've downloaded a bunch of different types of wires off the workshop and uh, found one that could be uh, turned into a procedural object. Uh, I didn't want to use a network because that is the, uh, the limit I think I'm most at risk of hitting first. Uh, so I've turned these wires into procedural objects and then I'm going to connect them up to the lampposts as you can see here. Uh, that's how the tram catenaries work in Kaliningrad and I wanted that um, less cluttered look. Um, so I used the uh, Network Skins 2 mod to remove all the catenaries on this tram road and then just uh, place the uh, wires in sequence uh, making the lampposts double up as catenaries. Uh, I think it's really just me being a bit of a stickler for the realism of it, but I like how it looks a lot better now. One last little detail I'm putting in here is this uh, tiny little vegetable patch, a uh, little community garden. Uh, allotmenting was obviously quite a big thing in the Soviet Union, but um, while that would have taken place mostly out in the daches in the countryside, uh, even in Kaliningrad you'd still see tiny little patches of grass that have been turned into uh, miniature vegetable gardens. And with that last detail, it's time to wrap this up. So that concludes episode number three. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed making it, and uh, I'm looking forward to making many, many more of these. Uh, I've been told these are quite relaxing to watch, so I've been pushing to get this out for New Year's Day in case any of you are nursing a New Year's hangover, in which case I feel for you, and I'm probably in the same boat by the time this one comes out uh, tomorrow, as it's New Year's Eve here right now. Next time we'll be working on the train station at the northern end of Lenin Avenue. We'll finally get some electrishkas running through the city. And that one should be out on the 17th of January. But until then, I wish you a happy 2021. Take good care of each other. And I'll see you in the next one.